We're going to finish up uh, the membrane lecture. I'm going to try and do this in about five to seven minutes, um, and then we'll, we'll move on to enzymes. All right, so uh, we left off in a slightly different location, but I wanted to just really quickly review with you guys uh, one of the first slides in, um, in the lecture last week on Thursday, uh, that highlighting uh, membrane composition. So I, I want you guys to, to remember that the, the plasma membrane, as we, as we described it, is comprised of both a lipid bilayer, which include those phospholipids we talked about, uh, and cholesterol, which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, uh, as well as uh, these proteins that are associated, remember, either with uh, the outer leaflet, the outside of the plasma membrane, the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane can be inserted via GPI or lipid moiety, or can be um, either embedded in the, um, in the membrane or uh, across the entire uh, membrane uh, and, and create what we call a transmembrane proteins. So just really briefly summarizing the functions. Primary function of the lipid bilayer is compartmentalization, um, uh, both localization of function. We've talked about things like uh, lysosomes, uh, also uh, the, the necessity to sequester transcription from translation, uh, these types of activities where the cell needs to separate uh, these types of activities. Uh, then also on and within the membrane uh, by raising and maintaining concentrations across, right, because the lipid bilayer is creating a barrier, right, uh, to prevent um, diffusion of molecules across, okay? Uh, also the regulation of transport primarily through the proteins that are inserted uh, in the membrane. Uh, finally, we talked really briefly about uh, the binding of ligands by receptors and uh, by their binding, inducing things uh, such as conformational changes in those membrane-bound proteins that then transmit that information from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell. We had one example, which was that of the TGF-beta receptor uh, coming together, being dimerized, and that dimerization within the membrane inducing its activity to transmit a signal. Uh, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit again today. Uh, and then also, um, primary uh, membrane functions are that of maintaining cell-cell adhesion and cell matrix, or what we would call cell substrate binding, again, through these receptors that are instead of binding soluble cues or binding insoluble fibrillar cues uh, within the extracellular matrix, and, and we'll have a whole lecture on that. All right, so where we left off was this idea of membrane fluidity. Remember we talked uh, briefly about if the membrane becomes too solid, uh, then it ceases uh, its normal functions because we restrict the fusion of those proteins within that fluid uh, lipid bilayer. This is obviously pretty critical for cold-blooded animals uh, and is also um, very important uh, in the design of drug delivery vehicles. We want those membranes also to be, to be pretty fluid, and so there are a lot of design components that go into that. And then again, remember real quickly that uh, we describe that fluidity of the membrane and regulators of the fluidity of that membrane being things like temperature, right, uh, that help uh, increase the energy uh, within that lipid bilayer, but also the degree of unsaturation. Uh, does anyone uh, want to remind us what saturation means versus unsaturated? Yeah. So saturated refers to the, the number of hydrogen atoms occupying those carbons. So if every carbon has the maximum number of hydrogen atoms associated with it, that's a state of saturation, complete saturation, right? Uh, unsaturated refers to the introduction of double bonds, which lower the number of possible hydrogens that can be associated with those carbons. If you remember the stick structure, right? So this would represent a fully saturated um, um, fatty acid, and this happens to be animal fat. Here we look at this fat, oleic acid from olive oil. Uh, it's got this uh, single double bond here. 
which again limits the number of hydrogens. We have two less hydrogens occupying this, uh, this acyl chain uh, than possible. Here's uh, Crisco. It also has a double bond. And what I want to really quickly describe, you guys have had general chemistry, but I want to touch on this again, which is this idea of cis, meaning the same. So when we talk about a cis double bond, what we're describing is that the two peripheral carbons are on the same side, quote unquote, same side, right? So this is a cis double bond. Trans, those carbons are going off in different directions, right? In opposite directions. So trans is opposite or facing, and cis is the same, okay? All right, and it's also regulated by uh, cholesterol in the membrane, and that's what we're gonna talk about now. All right, so we've talked about this concept before. Fatty acid tails are kinky, and the kinkier, the better. Um, so in this particular case, these would be fatty acid chains that are, uh, that are not ideal in a plasma membrane, uh, in a lipid bilayer, as far as introducing fluidity, right? Again, it has to do with the ability of those fatty acids to pack very tightly. And when we introduce kinks, uh, from a materials perspective, that's like introducing a dislocation in the potential crystalline structure uh, of a membrane, all right? And so here you see some very, uh, um, very highly uh, double bonded, unsaturated uh, fatty acids, yes? No, so these are, these are fatty acid chains. These are not amino acids, right? So these are not in the protein family, okay? It's a good point, right? This is, we're not describing proline here, yeah. Uh, it'll be drawn. It'll actually be drawn this way. So what we want, obviously, and that's a good point, what we want are cis double bonds. This does nothing for our breaking up of close packing of acyl chains, right? So if I have a ton of trans unsaturated double bonds, right? Trans double bonds still give me that very linear structure which allows those things to pack in very tightly, okay? So these are the ones we want, are these cis double bonds. Uh, okay, so what's with all the omega stuff? This is, uh, if you're, I don't know, th this for me is if you're at, at trivia night at uh, the local Taco Mac or something like that and, and are looking to win, uh, this question might come up. So omega refers to the nth carbon after which you find the first double bond. All right, so this is a, a fish oil. It's an omega-3 fatty acid. And the reason it's omega-3 is that one, two, three, that third carbon is where the first double bond occurs. This is an omega-6 fatty acid, and so, as the name implies, right here on the sixth carbon is where you find that first double bond, okay? That's what the omega designation stands for. It's, it's, due to the, it's due to the double bonded structure, right? So if they have double bonds and the double bonds are in a cis configuration, then it'll introduce a kink. Okay. All right, so cholesterol, another component of membranes. You can see it's actually, this winds up being a pretty stiff molecule itself. Uh, and it has some really interesting properties such that it serves to keep membranes fluid at low temperatures and yet it reduces fluidity at high temperatures. And how it does that is that it is, again, introducing this, this dislocation, this disruption in the ability of these phospholipids to pack in very tightly where they, they have a difficult time moving around one another, okay? And so if you lodge this stiff uh, cholesterol domain in there, then it introduces this, these gaps, as you can see here this ability to now for these uh, phospholipids to move around one another. But at really high temperatures where you'd expect these things to really have so much energy that they're moving apart, the hydrophobic association between cholesterol 
and those fatty acid chains actually winds up help, helping to hold them together. And so you'll get these regions of uh, induced stiffness around cholesterol domains. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so when we talk about lipid rafts, you'll read about this in signal transduction. Lipid rafts are defined as cholesterol-rich nanodomains in the plasma membrane. And so we talked a little bit about, uh, I highlighted why we might want to restrict certain proteins from diffusing, diffusing in 3D by only allowing them to diffuse in the plasma membrane, right? We reduce the degree of freedom and we increase the probability of two proteins interacting. Another way we can do that is we can induce, uh, we can create these raft domains, these lipid raft domains, where cholesterol is helping to cluster and hold these uh, raft-associated proteins and also certain raft-associated um, um, phospholipids in proximity to one another. And so we've reduced the degree of freedom to 2D diffusion. And now we're going to start packing them together so they only have to move in very short distances in order to interact with one another. And so lipid rafts are often seen as signaling centers. It's where we're trying to cluster a lot of uh, proteins that need each other in order to, to generate uh, their signal. Okay? And so you'll see this uh, when you're reading about signal transduction. You'll read a lot about lipid rafts. It's now becoming clear that we used to think of lipid rafts as a single entity, like everything in biology. Now there's, I think, somewhere upwards of a dozen different types of lipid rafts, depending on uh, how much cholesterol, which sphingolipids are in there, which types of fatty acids are in there, what types of proteins are in there. So there's some diversification of these individual structures within the plasma membrane that are optimized for signal transduction. All right, so let's get back to lupus, and we're going to talk a little bit now about phospholipid structure. We talked um, really quickly about the naming scheme, these being the four acids uh, that can be, uh, excuse me, alcohols uh, that are conjugated to um, these phospholipids uh, that then generate um, these, these phosphatidylcholine, serine, inositol, and ethanolamine. And we're going to focus on phosphatidylserine in the case of lupus. And an important fact uh, that you should be aware of is that the plasma membrane, I just described a higher level of organization associated with lipid rafts. There's also a higher level of organization regarding the asymmetry from the outer leaflet, so the, the leaflet of the plasma membrane that's facing the outside of the cell versus what we call the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. So there are a number of different transporters, ABC transporters, uh, these phospholipid scrambleases. They're enzymes known as flipases that help flip uh, these um, um, lipids uh, back and forth. There are also these amino phospholipid uh, translocases. And what the cell is doing is it's regulating what's on the outside and what's on the inside. Phosphatidylserine is critical in this because it is predominantly on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And what happens then, so phosphatidylserine is there, what happens when a cell is undergoing programmed cell death, or apoptosis? So when we refer to apoptosis, it means the cell has received certain signals, something like fast ligand, which triggers a programmed version of cell death, as opposed to me taking a pipette tip and puncturing the cell, that's going to lead to what we call necrosis, right? So unprogrammed cell death is necrosis. Programmed cell death is apoptosis. And one of the things that happens in apoptosis is that the cells start flipping their phosphatidylserine out to the outer leaflet of the membrane. And that's an important signal because that is what we call an eat me signal, right? So it is signifying to cells in your innate immune system that I'm either sick and dying or I've been told I need to go away, All right? Uh, this can be in the resolution of wound healing, right? We get massive proliferation of cells. They're repairing the tissue, but at some point in time, we need all those reparative cells to go away and they need to undergo programmed cell death. And then we need to clear out all of that cellular debris. 
And so phosphatidylserine on the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane becomes this eat me signal that's recognized by these cells, classically known as a phagocyte because they're phagocytosing or eating um, cells, bacteria, viruses. Uh, we now call them macrophages, okay? And these guys have receptors on their cell surface that recognize phosphatidylserine and the engagement of those receptors with phosphatidylserine induce a process known as phagocytosis. They will literally engulf that cell and continue to digest it. All right, so one potential hypothesis, remember the ideology of lupus is unknown, one hypothesis is that this receptor is damaged in some forms of lupus. And so some have hypothesized that this is a mechanism, right? A, a mechanism to explain the disease. So what happens when the garbage men go on strike is that the cells continue to apoptose and they start shedding both uh, small apoptotic blebs and these large apoptotic blebs known as apoptotic bodies, right? So they start blebbing, they start shedding these large bits of themselves out and what's loaded in those things are nuclear proteins. So remember we describe lupus as being a disease associated with the production of antibodies against nuclear proteins. So this is one hypothesis about why you might actually develop antibodies against nuclear proteins. Uh, I've got a short little video here showing the blebbing. That's really fast. But in this case, the cells are stimulated with fast ligand, which induces a caspase-driven uh, apoptotic pathway. They bleb, they go away. All right. All right, so if you're interested in things like autoimmunity, apoptosis, or engulfment, uh, there are a number of great investigators here. Uh, UVA is a fantastic place for immunity uh, inflammation research. Okay. So I'm going to switch over to enzymes. Are there any questions uh, that I can answer while I'm swapping over? Okay. I'm just going to reduce that. Okay. I'll give you guys a breather. Just a second. Swap over some of my notes. All right. Okay, so thus far in this class, uh, we've, di we've discussed amino acids, we've discussed protein structure, we've discussed how protein, how the amino acid sequence can direct uh, three-dimensional structure, right? So secondary structures such as alpha helices, beta sheets, right? Tertiary structures, how those multiple secondary structures create the three-dimensional form of a single protein and quaternary structure, how multiple proteins might come together to create a macromolecular complex. So we've talked about structure. Now we want to talk a little bit about how structure of proteins then relate to their actual function. Now, some, some structural uh, motifs that we've talked about lead to the function of traversing the membrane. And here we're going to talk about how that structure might regulate enzymatic activity. And we're going to do that in the context of this uh, disease known as uh, botulism. Okay. All right. So botulism is a disease caused by a bacterial infection. Uh, the bacteria is Clostridium botulinum. Uh, it is a for, uh, excuse me, a spore-forming bacteria uh, that's really common in the soil. So of course. Uh, being the parent of recent toddlers, you very routinely teach your kid, do not eat dirt. This is maybe one reason. So how then do adults and kids that have been taught not to eat dirt, how do they wind up getting botulism? So one way is improper storage of food. There is another way. Does anyone want to fathom a natural way? Yes. Absolutely. So there's a way that we purposefully, there's something that also that we purposefully ingest that can give you this. Yes. Yeah, so certainly washing food preparation is a part of it. What's something that you might intentionally ingest? Does anyone know? 
It is, but I'm not purposefully ingesting that. But you're right. <laughs> At least not today I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. But again, that's really about a fo uh, food preparation. So honey. So botulinum uh, toxin is actually in honey. So you do not give your babies honey when they're little. Of course, you'd have to ingest so much honey, you'd get a sick stomach before you would develop uh, botulinum, uh, uh, have the effects of the neurotoxin, but it is actually in honey. All right, so what are the symptoms? Flaccid paralysis sounds awful, and it sort of is. Uh, this is where you lose the ability to contract muscles. All of your muscle contraction ceases. This obviously makes it pretty difficult to swallow and speak. Uh, you can see uh, clear signs of facial weakness uh, here in this gentleman here on the right. Droopy eyelids, right? Dyspenia. This is probably one of the worst. Anyone know what dyspenia is? Yeah. Exactly. Trouble breathing, right? So my diaphragm is what is actually causing a negative pressure on my lungs and allowing me to inhale. So if I cannot contract my muscles, I can't contract my diaphragm, I can't pull a negative pressure, and I can't breathe, okay? Breathing, sort of important for life, so not really great. All right, but before you die, you will suffer from nausea, vomiting, and other things. All right, so the prevalence of this disease is quite rare, all right? We're actually pretty good about washing our fruits and vegetables, thankfully. And apparently our kids do listen to at least one of our lessons, which is don't eat dirt. Okay. Uh, botulism works via the secretion of a toxin known as the botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin is an enzyme, which is why we chose this disease. Okay. Yes, botulinum toxin is Botox. Uh, and you can imagine if I'm here, I've got my little crow's feet at age, I won't tell you. And um, if I want to remove them, one way I can do that is to relax all the muscles in my face. And so I can get shots of botul Botox in my face and relieve some of, the, uh, some of the, the lines that you clearly do not see from way up there. All right. Uh, it is among the world's most deadly toxins. The LD50 is about 100 nanograms uh, for an average person. Anyone want to fathom a guess what a LD50 means? Yeah. What does that mean, median lethal dose? Yeah, so you're really close, and I just want to be really specific. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's the specific definition of a lethal dose. LD50 is if I give 100 people this particular dose, 50 of those people will die. Okay. All right, again, this toxin is an enzyme. Uh, everyone saw the pre-lecture. An enzyme is a protein that catalyzes a reaction, right? facilitates a reaction. All right, so we're very briefly going to uh, review um, some of the material that was in the, the pre-lecture, and that's uh, the michaelis minton uh, um, model for enzyme kinetics. Uh, again, uh, this is a, I'll reiterate, uh, what Dr. Jane said in the pre-lecture, which is that this is a model. This is not a law of enzyme kinetics. It's a model to predict and uh, to um, estimate uh, what the, the conversion of substrate to product uh, under the conditions of that specific enzyme. Vmax, remember, is the rate at saturation for a given enzyme concentration in moles per unit time. Please be really specific when you're uh, studying about like how this is worded. The rate at, at, at saturation, right? It's an asymptote uh, here when the solute, when the substrate concentration is, is, is very high, 
for a given enzyme concentration. That's critical in moles per unit time. All right. The Michaelis con constant, or Km, is the substrate concentration that gives the half maximal velocity. These are oftentimes, well, always determined experimentally. So we described in the pre-lecture how you determine this, how you establish this curve. From that curve, you can't actually determine the precise Vmax, but you can get, you can find the estimate for it, right? We're going to go down half of that Vmax, and we're going to use that parabolic equation in order to derive the Km, or the Michaelis constant. Okay. All right couple of assumptions that were harped on in the pre-lecture, and I'll harp on them once again, which is that the enzyme substrate complex is at steady state. Remember, it's E plus S, and there's a reversible reaction to the ES complex. That's simply the association constant, right? How quickly they associate and how quickly they dissociate. So if I were to write that up, right, E plus S, in the forward direction, we call it K1, but that's also known as the association constant. It gives rise to the ES complex. The reverse is K minus 1. That's also what we call the dissociation constant, right? So this is just a binding event, okay? All right, that has to be at steady state, which means that, that there is no net change. The delta per time of the enzyme substrate complex is zero. It's not changing its concentration, okay? The other is that there is way more substrate than there is enzyme, right? So the enzyme, if you remember from the equation, goes to E plus product. E is regenerated. <laughs> it comes back here and continues to participate in the reaction. S is consumed. Right, so what we don't want is S to become a limiting factor because then all of the, uh, the equations fail, okay? So the idea is that you can never get rid of the substrate, okay? All right, um, I can't harp on this enough. You guys just focus on this slide, know this equation. <laughs> It's not blue, but I'd strongly suggest that it, it be in blue. Um, all right, so let's test our understanding of this. All right, here's a little uh, problem for us to do in class. You do an enzyme rate experiment and get the following values of V at different um, substrate concentrations. Km is approximately what? All right, I'm going to give you between 60 seconds and 120 seconds to figure this out. These are, this is your experimental data set. At this concentration of S, you've measured a velocity of this. Yes, S in a bracket. If you have brackets around, in this case, S, that would be a concentration. If it's around E, that would be the enzyme concentration. Uh, you can. I don't think you'll need to in this, but you certainly are more than welcome to. Anyone want to fathom a guess? Yeah. 1.1, 1 1.2. You want to work through the math for me? How did you estimate that? Okay. 
Does everyone understand that? So what he did was he estimated the Vmax. So you, the only way you can do that is that your velocity numbers, right, measurements start to plateau. If they look like they're going linear, we haven't given you enough information, right? You have to see where your saturation is, right? This is the point of saturation. So he observed that the data go to saturation right around 12, 12.2 probably. He took half that, that's the Vmax, took half of that, that's around 6, 6.1, something like that. And he looked at the data set and said that, well, the half max is somewhere between the 5.6 value and the 9 value, which is somewhere between 1 and 2. And he made an estimation that's probably closer to 1 than it is to 2, right? So I'd say 1.1, 1.2, somewhere in that, in that zone seems like a reasonable guess. Yes? Remember, when you're finding the Michaelis constant, the Michaelis constant is the concentration of the substrate that gives rise to the half max uh, velocity, right? So again, if I'm drawing the curve, here's V max. The Km, right, is here. This is substrate concentration. Km is the concentration that gives us half Vmax. That's the definition of the Michaelis constant. Okay? It does not equal one half K max. It equals the substrate concentration that gives rise to the half max based on that enzyme's activity. Um, no, so here, these are experimentally derived values, right? So someone gets a concentration of 0.5 nanomolar and measures this velocity, velocity one, which is 2.7. They do 5.6 concentration, they measure, uh, excuse me, one, and they measure 5.6 as a velocity. They do two, they measure four, they measure eight, and they measure 16. That's what they're doing. They're using the substrate concentration and they're calculating Vmax. If you need help on this, I would suggest that you go back and watch the pre-lecture where Dr. James goes through exactly how we go through measuring this crap, I think is how he puts it. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's keep moving on because we do have a lot more to get through today. All right, so think back to the pre-lecture. Here's another thought experiment. Which of the two of these illustrated reactions is gonna go faster, A or B? Why? All right, I heard it here and then I think I heard it reverberated. So the activation energy is lower, right? All right, so let's talk about inhibitors, and then we're going to talk about regulation. So obviously inhibitors, an inhibitor is a type of regulation, which implies that we're going to downregulate. We're going to reduce the activity of enzymatic activity. And the reality is that many drugs, like Cipro, a lot of the anti-HIV drugs, are actually enzyme inhibitors. There are two main kinds of inhibitors that we're going to expect you guys to be um, uh, responsible for knowing one is competitive and one is non-competitive. As you can imagine, then uh, competitive inhibitors are going to bind to the active site of the enzyme. So they're competing with substrate for the same site. Okay. So uh, anyone want to remind me how we designate, how we label or call or name enzymes from the pre-lecture? They always end in something, yeah. ACE, ACE, that's right, A-S-E. So we're gonna call this one triangle protease, all right? So it's gonna bind blue triangle. It's a peptidase or a protease, so it's gonna cleave that triangle. 
What a competitive inhibitor is going to do is it's going to bind that pocket, but it doesn't look like triangle. Not quite, right? It's got enough difference that the enzyme recognizes it, but can't actually facilitate that catalytic reaction. In this case, proteolysis. All right. These are going to alter the Michaelis constant, but not Vmax. Why? You want to fathom a guess? Yeah. To Vmax, right? So Vmax is a characteristic of the enzyme. And we haven't changed the enzyme's activity. We're only binding up and blocking its active site. Okay? So we're changing the concentration that's going to be required in order to reach uh, the, the KM, right? All right. So what's going to happen if we, so one way to answer this as well is what will happen it, to V, to the velocity of this reaction, if we push the substrate to very high concentrations? What will happen? Yeah. What's that? It'll max out. What does that imply when I tell you that nothing happens to Vmax, right? That we haven't altered Vmax. And I go to infinity substrate. Yeah. Yeah, the enzyme still becomes saturated. Vmax is a, is a property of the enzyme. So the inhibitor ultimately fails at very high concentrations, right? Because we're not actually altering the enzymatic activity, right? And so what you'll find is that, if I were to draw this out, oh, that's kind of tailing off. All right, here's Vmax. When I add a competitive inhibitor, what I'm gonna get is something that looks like that. It's still headed to the same Vmax, but now when we look at the half Vmax, I've increased the Km, right? So we'll call that Km prime versus Km. So I've increased the concentration required to get to that half Vmax. Okay, non-competitive inhibitors are fundamentally different. Uh, here, they're going to bind somewhere else besides, this is still blue triangle protease, um, but our inhibitor is going to bind somewhere else, a distant site, an allosteric site, and it's going to regulate then the enzymatic activity. Allostery, or the allosteric site, refers to a process known as allostery. Allostery is action from a distance. It's the easiest way to remember it. Action from a distance. So I'm a relatively large protein, and I can have something bind a distant site and affect the enzyme's ability to convert substrate into product. How might it do that? What's one unifying theme in our protein conversations? Yes. Yes, yes, it changes the structure, right? We induce a conformational change, which is going to I, disrupt that catalytic site or alter the catalytic site so it's less effective. So a theoretically perfect non-competitive inhibitor is only going to alter the Vmax. It actually won't affect Km. Uh, I've got an eraser here. All right, so in that case of a non-competitive inhibitor, here's Vmax. Now, a non-competitive inhibitor is going to look something like this, right? So this is Vmax prime. So we've changed the Vmax. If I look at half of this guy, well, he's kind of inhibited it by 50%. So the half Vmax of this guy is right here, and there's his Km. And the half Vmax of this guy is somewhere right around here, and his Km is right there, right? 
So that's the perfect, the theoretically perfect non-competitive inhibitor. You haven't changed the Michaelis constant, but you have changed the Vmax. All right, so here it is. It converts substrate into product. This is a non-competitive inhibitor. It binds at an allosteric site, and it changes the structure of that catalytic domain. And now, triangle can't bind circle, right? Okay, so what'll happen in this case to the uh, velocity of the reaction if you push the substrate very, very high? Sorry, one and one. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so there are a number of reasons, right? So uh, it's a great question. So let's say that I have a protein that is binding to the top side of this enzyme and it's doing it through ionic interactions. Now I've changed the surface energy of that protein, right? And those Ionic changes, let's say I actually, you know, those ionic forces and ionic bonds are strong enough to pull or disform, right, deform that protein. Because it's a single, in this case, a single protein, those changes usually are transmitted throughout the entire protein. Right? And so it's going to be through ionic interactions, hydrogen bonds, all the same things that regulate protein structure are going to also when two proteins come together, or in this case, an inhibitor binds an enzyme, those are the same forces that are going to drive conformational changes, right? Okay. All right. So, when we talk about regulation, we've talked about inhibition. Inhibition is a form of regulation. Uh, let's talk and expand this concept a little bit uh, to allosteric regulation, which is when a regulatory molecule it could be an inhibitor, but it could also be an enhancer, right? So in this case, we're going to bind to a site separate from the active site, and we're going to alter the shape, right? So we're going to change the conformation of the enzyme to change its activity. But when we talk about regulation, it can go both in the positive direction and the negative direction. It can actually increase the enzymatic activity in this way. All right, these enzymes usually, enzymes that function this way, usually have what we call a catalytic, right, or the active domain, and what we would call a regulatory, regulatory domain. Here's a little cartoon. Here's R, a lot of times denoted by R, the regulatory domain. See the catalytic domain. Here's the allosteric site. You get this, in this case, an allosteric inhibitor, but it could be an allosteric activator that binds to that regulatory domain and changes the shape of the catalytic domain in this case, such that it can't turn this substrate into these two products, okay? All right, so I'm gonna back up a little bit and just talk about some vocabulary, just so that we're really clear. And what I wanna focus on here is the difference between what we call a domain and what we call a subunit. Domains are structurally and functionally distinct regions of a single protein, one, long polypeptide chain that's formed a, a tertiary structure that has multiple, both structurally distinct and functionally distinct regions within that single protein, okay? Here's an example. This is a protein, just a random protein pulled up, and you can see even just by eye. It doesn't take a rocket science to figure out this looks, this domain could be described very distinctly from this domain here. So domain A and domain B. I can't tell you what domain A and domain B are on this particular protein. It could be that this domain A is the catalytic domain and this is the regulatory domain or vice versa. But the point is that they're both structurally and functionally distinct, but it's a single protein. The difference is when we talk about a subunit. A subunit implies that there are two separate proteins that have come together right? And those two subunits work together, right? They may have, one may have a regulatory activity and the other one may have a catalytic activity, but they're two separate proteins that are working together. That's the key difference, right? So if I'm talking about this type of structure, what would I 
what type of structure is this here of a single protein? This is back to tertiary. What is this structure? Quaternary. What's a protein that we've talked about in the past already that has that is demonstrative of a protein with multiple subunits? Yeah. A ribosome is pretty complicated example, but yes. What's one that we actually used? Uh, hemoglobin. Not the red blood cell, but the hemoglobin within, right? Had two A subunits and two B subunits. Those are four distinct proteins that were coming together in this macromolecular complex uh, to function. All right, if we look at the structure uh, of botulinum toxin, we find it is a single protein and it's divided into three domains, a receptor binding domain, a translocation domain, and a catalytic domain, okay? I do wanna make a note that chain is an ambiguous term. You're gonna read papers and it's gonna say this chain, that chain. Chain does not give you any information uh, that to imply whether it's a single protein or multiple proteins, okay? So just be careful about reading chain and assuming that means subunit or domain. It does not. It has to do with, it's a historical designation of a lot of times how the proteins were discovered. In this case, as you'll find out, this single protein as a part of its activity is cleaved right here in this domain, right? During its natural lifetime of this protein, and when you're isolating botulinum toxin, depending on the state that it's in, it appears on Western blot or by SDS gel as two bands. And they said, ah, there's a heavy chain and a light chain, right? So it's a descriptor of an experimental process. So just be real careful, okay? All right. So different types of regulation. We just talked about allosteric regulation. Another type of regulation is that of covalent modification. All right, here's enzyme X. And by adding or removing groups, right? In particular, we'll use this example like a phosphate group by kinases. Kinases are a specialized type of enzyme that catalyze the phosphorylation or the addition of phosphate groups onto specific amino acid residues. There are enzymes that remove those phosphate groups called phosphatases, right? So kinases are gonna add those phosphate groups, phosphatases are gonna remove those phosphate groups. Kinases and phosphatases, the reason I'm kind of harping on it is that when we get to signal transduction, this is a major mode of signal transduction, how signals are propagated from the cell membrane all the way to the nucleus or through phosphorylation and dephosphorylation um, enzymes. All right, so here's X Enzyme, enzyme X with X kinase. Let's say it's a, uh, it's a uh, excuse me, it is a kinase. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it's gonna phosphorylate a residue. And as a consequence of the addition of all that negative charge, right, we're changing the energy landscape of that protein and now shifting ionic bonds around, perhaps disrupting hydrogen bonding. You're gonna get a shape change and as a function of that shape change, you're gonna alter the activity of that enzyme. Just to remind you, the amino acids that are routinely phosphorylated on our proteins, in our bodies, are serines, threonines, and tyrosines. Again, if you're reading about signal transduction, uh, tyrosine phosphorylation seems to be the most prevalently studied. It's unclear if it's the most prevalent mechanism in our cells or a lot of times you'll see lots of literature when we have good reagents to measure. We have great reagents to measure phosphotyrosine. We have far worse <laughs> reagents to measure phosphocerine and phosphotreonine. All right, another way is to cleave bonds. So we can convert things like proenzymes. Remember I talked about this designation of pro proteins pro in front of a proenzyme or a pro protein implies that there's some type of processing step to get the mature product. In this case, it's an enzyme that, ha that has to undergo some type of, in this case, proteolytic cleavage in order to become active. We call these proenzymes, 
You'll also see them in literature uh, called zymogens. The best example of this is the blood clotting cascade. If you go and look at it, it is a bunch of zymogens that activate one another in this long cascade that leads to the activation of thrombin, and thrombin cleaves fibrinogen, and it self-assembles into a polymer. And that's how we stop, one of the reasons why we stop bleeding, okay? So enzymes that act on other enzymes cleave through proteolysis to activate or deactivate, right? So we're gonna find that out. Botulinum toxin winds up being a protease that inactivates a key protein in our body. All right, finally, another type of regulation is that of association and dissociation of subunits. Again, I'll use the demonstrative example of something like TGF-beta receptor, which is two subunits that are separated in the plasma membrane, and the binding of TGF-beta induces their association with one another. When those two halves of the TGF-beta receptor come together, they activate, they become active, and now can, uh, can translate their signal. All right, they're actually known as a receptor tyrosine kinase. They're a receptor that has kinase activity in the tail domain, right, in the intracellular compartment. Okay. All right. The final that we're gonna talk about is cooperativity. And again, this one's a little more complicated. I think maybe we're doing okay. Um, cooperativity is when a product, right, one of the products promotes the formation of more product. So I have an enzyme. It's going to act on the substrate and generate a product. The best example of that is if that enzyme has a binding site for that product, which changes its conformation and enhances its enzymatic activity. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Positive feedback loop. Now, it can also be feedback, but negative, right? So it could be that in many cases, the production of product actually comes back and inhibits the enzyme. And that's a way that we make sure the enzymes don't run amok, right? Is that their products begin to lower their activity. All right, in this case, uh, it can imply multiple catalytic subdomains or other types of self-reinforcing catalysis. And in this case, we can't use the straight up Michaelis-Menten uh, model for enzyme mechanics, uh, excuse me, uh, enzyme kinetics. Uh, in this case, uh, a gentleman by the name of Hill actually measuring, trying to figure out how on earth to explain oxygen association with none other than hemoglobin. Right? So hemoglobin, the four subunits, actually exhibit cooperativity, where the first oxygen is the hardest to bind. Once that oxygen binds to one subunit, it enhances the affinity of the other subunits to bind additional oxygens. So you can almost actually, yeah, it's very difficult to get it on. It's actually very difficult to get that last oxygen off as well. And you guys will learn more about that in physiology. So he described this factor known as the Hill coefficient, which is modifying the standard Michaelis-Minton equation in this way, where it becomes an exponent for the concentration of substrate and an exponent uh, on the Michaelis constant. This is discovered or determined experimentally. And it can be a non-integer as well. It can be 1.5, 1.3. It is, we're we're measuring the kinetics of that enzyme, and we're almost reverse engineering the equation to model that behavior, okay? But you can see where the Hill coefficient, here are these ends, a Hill coefficient of one, two, and four is indicating a degree of cooperativity within that enzyme. And I hope what you can see from these curves is that the higher level of cooperativity the sharper that curve becomes. It goes from parabolic to sigmoidal, and the concentration range with which that enzyme now is operating becomes much tighter, right? So this is a really great way that we control when enzymes will become active and when not, right? Okay, a good example is that of glycogen synthase kinase three, 
and get ready for this kind of designation. There's even a map kinase, kinase, kinase. And it has to do, again, with historically how things were discovered. Someone discovered map kinase, and they're like, oh, wait, it's regulated by another kinase. Well, we've got to call that one map kinase, kinase. And then somebody else came along and said, oh, there's another kinase that activates that kinase. So that one's called map kinase, kinase, kinase. So you can see it, it tail spins really quickly. So in this case, glycogen synthase kinase is a kinase that is going to phosphorylate glycogen synthase. Glycogen synthase is its own enzyme that creates, synthesizes glycogen. And glycogen synthase kinase, or GSK3, recognizes this motif. Okay, when I describe a motif, we're talking about a linear sequence, peptide sequence, uh, that is recognized by a protein. Okay, in this case, it is serine, XXX, X means it can be any amino acid, serine XXX phosphoserine. So what happens in this case is another enzyme, another kinase called CK2, phosphorylates this first serine. GSK3 recognizes serine XXX phosphoserine and phosphorylates that serine residue. Of course, now it recognizes the next serine XXX phosphoserine and continues to phosphorylate down that chain, okay? All right, okay, so we have 15 minutes, I think, actually almost 20, so I think we're about on time. Um, so was everyone able, actually it doesn't matter, I'm gonna play this video for you on basic neurotransmission, uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll get into it. Oh, and it's not playing. Okay. The action potential cannot cross the synaptic space, but if each of the axon terminal, it causes membrane stacks called vesicles to move toward the membrane of the axon terminal. The membrane of the vesicle fuses with the membrane of the axon terminal, enabling the vesicles to release its contents into the synaptic space. The molecules released from the vesicles are chemicals called neurotransmitters. They drift across the synaptic space and bind to special proteins called receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. The binding of the neurotransmitter to its receptor can trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. That electrical signal then moves toward the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron. Now that the neurotransmitter has relayed its message, it releases from the receptor into the synaptic space. Some of the neurotransmitter is degraded by enzymes in the synaptic space, and some of the neurotransmitter is carried back into the presynaptic neuron through transporter proteins. The neurotransmitter that is taken back up into the presynaptic neuron is then repackaged into vesicles that can be released the next time an action potential reaches the axon terminal. The entire process repeats each time an action potential reaches the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. Okay, I think that's it. All right, so this is just a little bit of a primer. It's talked a little bit about membrane fusion, about diffusion of a soluble factor, about binding to receptors. So this is a great example of a lot of things we've already talked about. But what we're gonna focus on in, in botulism and botulinum toxin is this process of vesicle fusion. All right, so we talked about membranes in the last, uh, the last lecture. Uh, the ability to get membranes to fuse is an extremely high energy effort. Uh, if there are any water molecules that are between the two adjacent phospholipid bilayers, uh, you will not get fusion. And so we have a series of proteins that bind each other, undergo this, um, I don't want to say cooperative because we just use that term and it would be inappropriate here, but a sort of uh, coordinated um, conformational change that squeeze all the water molecules out from between those two lipid bilayers and then allow fusion, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, so botulism effectively impacts this, these two sort of uh, diagrams here, these um, 
it's a steer molecular dynamics simulation by this group in, in Denmark showing vesicular fusion and release of contents. So what does a synaptic vesicle then really look like? It's not these idealized cartoons that we tend to draw. It is a lipid bilayer that is absolutely chocker box full of proteins that do all sorts of things, right? One of those is this protein, synaptobrevin, and it's the focus of um, uh, the botulinum toxin. These proteins are gonna do a number of different things, but in the case of vesicular fusion, the snare proteins, of which synaptobrevin is one of, uh, are these proteins also known as SNAP receptors. Uh, and these are the proteins that are essentially labeling both the vesicle, the vesicle has certain V-snares, vesicular snares or V-snares, that give it its specific character, right? V-snares are gonna bind to very specific T-snares, or you can think about it as target membrane snares or target snares. The V-snare and the T-snare does two things. One is it helps to localize the ves vesicle to its proper location. So you can think about it almost like zip codes, right? My address is my T-snare, and the zip code on the, on the vesicle is the V-snare, and they, only when they find each other will they induce a fusion event. Okay, so you have ves vesicles that are going all across the all across the cell, and they need to fuse with certain domains or other certain membranes and not others. Okay, so that's one is that it helps target right the vesicle to the right membrane. The other is that when they bind each other, they undergo a conformational change that's coordinated with one another. So they look like this, they bind, and then they start wrapping around each other like a rope. So they form what we call a coil-coil structure, and it's just like a rope that you twist, right? If you keep, if you hold one steady and you twist a rope and keep, keep twisting that rope, all of a sudden it's going to start kinking and the length of that rope starts shortening, right? That's essentially what snares are going to do, all right? So synaptobrevin is the V-snare that's found in synaptic vesicles containing the neurotransmitters. Here's synaptobrevin. It's going to bind syntaxin on the outer, um, on the plasma membrane. It's going to undergo this sort of wrapping around one another. And as a consequence, it pulls those two membranes ever so close, squeezes out every single water molecule between the phospholipids, and then they can fuse. All right? What botulinum toxin does is it's an enzyme that's going to cut synaptobrevin. All right. So how botulinum toxin works, the bacteria invades the gut. It starts producing botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin is going to multiply and secrete the toxin. The toxin is actually going to traverse the, the gut, the intestinal epithelium. And we haven't defined epithelium to this point, but there are two types of, mainly two types of cells in the body, what we call mesenchymal, or cells that are predominantly uh, adhered to their extracellular environment, right? And epithelial cells, which are primarily using cell-cell contact for their adhesive mechanism. And what epithelial cells are gonna do is they're gonna form these large sheets. And essentially, their goal is to create barriers. Our skin is an epithelial barrier. Our eyes, our mouths, our lungs, our intestines, everything that faces out to the environment, that is an epithelial barrier or an epithelial sheet. So the intestine, yes, is exposed to the elements through my oral cavity, right? And so it is technically facing the outside. It's gonna, the toxin actually traverses, right now one of the primary hypotheses for how it gets across that, which would normally be impermissive for large proteins like uh, the botulinum toxin to get through, they're a process known as trans, uh, transmigration. That's not right. Trans, what's my brain? My brain is, is frying. I'll get it to you guys. It's, um, uh, I hate it when my brain does that. It's a process that a lot of um, bacteria, a lot of viruses, but also our um, cells of our immune system have evolved this mechanism to basically migrate right through a cell. 
and it's some pretty interesting mechanisms. All right, gets into the bloodstream. It makes its way to the motor neurons, and it's internalized by that process that we've highlighted before known as endocytosis, right? So endocytosis, the cell is going to uh, form a vesicle on the, on the plasma membrane. It's going to pull in proteins and products from its extracellular environment. It's going to pinch those off and bring them in to the cell, endocytosis, as opposed to exocytosis, where it's pushing them out into the extracellular environment. Okay, so if we look at that domain architecture, architecture of the toxin, those, and we look back at those three domains, what we find is that there's a receptor binding domain. And so that receptor binding domain is what's going to bind to the motor neuron, and that's going to actually trigger a phagocytic, a phagocytic or an endocytic, in this case, uh, um, process. So here it's triggering endocytosis. This domain, this translocation domain, uh, remember we talked about how in endosomes they become more and more acidic, right? As they usually traverse towards the lysosome, they're going to become more acidic because they have proton pumps that are pumping protons into the lumen. That translocation domain is pretty clever. It actually will undergo a huge shape change under acidic conditions and it acts like a harpoon and basically will embed itself in the membrane of that endosome and bust it, right? So it destabilizes that membrane, the membrane bursts, it expels its contents, and now there's a cleavage event that occurs between the catalytic domain and the rest of this molecule. That's where they figured out there's a light chain and a heavy chain, okay? So the light chain is the catalytic domain. Um, all right, so this is just me writing it out. Toxin escapes the vesicles through that harpoon mechanism. The light chain separates from the rest through a proteolytic cleavage. Uh, and the light chain is what we call a zinc endopeptidase. So this is in a large class of proteins known as um, metalloproteases. It means they need a metal ion. You need a divalent cation usually in order, uh, always actually, for their activity. Endopeptidase means it's going to cleave in the middle of a protein, as opposed to an exopeptidase, which chews from the edges, right? From the N or C terminus, an exopeptidase will start chewing up. Endopeptidase is cut right in the middle of the, well, not right in the middle of the protein, but you get the point, in the middle of the chains. All right, so if we cleave synaptobrevin and there's no synaptobrevin, there's no vesicle fusion, no neurotransmitter release, and all of a sudden I can't contract my muscles. Okay, there's paralysis. All right, so remember enzymes are, are uh, catalysts. The real problem here is that the toxin keeps catalyzing the reaction, the same reaction over and over again, and it can survive for days. So the real question is how much damage can it do? All right, so last problem. Let's test our understanding now of the concept of turnover. So I'm going to give you a couple facts. For botulinum toxin, the Vmax is 14 micromolar per minute at an enzyme concentration of 100 nanomolar, molecular weight of 50 kilodaltons. What is the turnover rate for botulinum toxin? Can anyone remind us from the pre-lecture what turnover rate is? You guys remember? Yes, the number of reactions per second per catalytic domain, okay? All right, so I'm going to give you, we've got a little bit of time, so I'm going to give you a minute or two to work through this problem, and then we'll see what our guesses are. <laughs> 
is the reactions per second. So it's a per second. Megawatt? Molecular weight. I'm sorry, yeah, molecular weight is 50 kilodaltons. Kilodaltons. Okay, does anybody want to fathom a guess? Yeah. Two point eight per second? All right, how'd you get the number? Okay. All right. Anybody else? It's actually not far off. <laughs> Anybody else want to take a stab at it? All right. Let's work through it. So remember that, uh, again, the turnover is kcat, right? It's the number of, it's the maximum number of conversions of substrate to product, which is what our Vmax is telling us, right? Vmax is 14 micromolar per second. Okay. Oh, thank you. That would be important. I'll get way off. All right. But it's defined at a specific concentration, 100 nanomolar of enzyme. All right. Okay. So 14 micromolar per second. God bless America. Holy moly. Per minute. All right, we can convert that to seconds, right, if you want, which I apparently need to do. One minute over 60 seconds, right? And then times divided by, right, divided by the concentration of our enzyme, right? So that's going to be 100 nanomolars is how many micromolars? Anyone know that off the top of their head? 10 times, right, 10 to the negative 3, right? So 1 nanomolar is 0.1 micromolar. All right, so micromolar cancels, minute cancels. All right, 14 divided by 0.1 is 140. All right, you just move the decimal place over one. Divided by 60 gives us about 2.33 product per second. Okay. At Vmax, that's how much product per minute we're making. We convert that to seconds per, so this is why I made a big point out about saying per single catalytic site. That's why we're dividing by the number of moles of enzyme. Because we're not trying to figure out how many per 100 nanomole of enzyme, but per one molecule, okay? All right. Um, just because we're at the very end, uh, what else would you need to know in order to predict the damaging, how damaging a single molecule of toxin would be? What else is missing from this paradigm? I'm telling you, this thing can catalyze a single molecule, catalyze 2.33 reactions per second. How fast will it kill a neuron, a motor neuron? What, yeah. That's important, but for a single, a single neuron, since we're out of time, I'll go ahead and tell you, you need to know the amount of substrate, right? So it turns out that there are about 70 synaptobrevins per vesicle, and there are about 150-ish vesicles per motor neuron. So you can do the math and figure out it takes actually 
around an hour when you factor in diffusion, and about a few hours, one single toxin can eliminate the activity of a single motor neuron, okay? That's why, that's why it is so bad. The treatment are inhibitors, right? Antitoxins, antibodies that block the catalytic site. All right, uh, there's a quiz on Thursday. Again, it's a new room, so I strongly suggest you come a little bit early and make sure that you can log in to the question press in this room, okay?